and welcome to Money Life News and Views. I'm Devashish Basin. Buffeted by bad news since late last year, global markets have been falling and they've been falling more or less in sync. But that was right until mid-June this year. Around June 17, markets all around the world started bottoming out and rallied very hard and fast right until mid-August. So that's for about two months of rally. During these two months, an interesting thing happened. When Nifty rose from around 15,000 to 17,000, almost 18,000, a rise of 17.7%, the S&P 500, the leading US index, was also up by 17.7%, and there was no surprise there. But what happened next was truly stunning against all conventional assumptions. From 4,305 on 16th August, the S&P slumped 14.2% by 23rd September, wiping out almost all the gains of the previous two months. Strikingly, however, Nifty refused to fall as much. In fact, it dropped from its peak of 17,980 to only about 3.6% over the same period. And I'm not talking of the last two days of fall. Nifty performed a stunning feat of 10.6% of outperformance over S&P 500 that has turned an old maxim on its head. And that is when the US market sneezes, emerging markets catch a cold. India's sharp and surprising outperformance has led to a chorus of predictions that India and the developed countries are getting decoupled. In a climate of bubbling patriotism, such ideas catch very fast and go very far. We last heard of decoupling in the big boom of 2003 to 2007, when the Indian markets rose far more sharply and much, much higher than the US market. However, once this became evident, it soon became a popular view among foreign institutional investors, and they started chasing debt-laden Indian real estate and infrastructure companies with poor growth prospects. And the 2000 eight crash hit the world, no market was spared. Indian markets crashed in sync with the development, developed markets over 60% as herd behavior of panic and fear took over. What about the decoupling story this time? Human minds have two notable features when they observe some new evidence or data. One, we are predisposed to quickly see a pattern in that data. Two, we jump to conclusions and extrapolate. Both can turn out to be quite misleading. Just because India has outperformed the US markets in a short period, and that is a very recent period, does not mean that this is based on fundamental reasons that are here to stay and forms a pattern. Nor is it possible to predict that it can continue with the help of just two months of data quickly extrapolated. The bigger question is, is there really any decoupling? Well, firstly, there isn't one. Our idea of Indian outperformance comes from com comparing with S&P 500, which is a dollar denominated index, whereas Nifty or Sensex is a rupee denominated index. It amounts to comparing apples and oranges. Also, the underperformance of US indices and outperformance of Indian indices has no real practical meaning for us the Indian investors, because we are not investing in the US in any case. It is relevant only to those people, so let's say foreign institutional investors, who can and have a chance and an easy option to invest both in the US and in India. Over any medium to long term, they would have been better served by investing in the US than in India. As measured by indices, what they gained in capital appreciation, the lost in rupee depreciation. In dollar terms, the Indian market has always been a terrible performer. So there is no real decoupling there for those investors for whom it really matters. Secondly, there are specific reasons for the recent outperformance as explained by Twitter handle Polo Macro. India suddenly seemed to be the most attractive emerging market story compared to Latin America, China, and Russia. A few months ago, Paul, Paul writes, foreigners realize that you can't invest in, in China because who knows what comes with Xi Jinping. Russia is out because of the war. Their investments anyway were locked in. Uh, pink socially, socialist tide is rolling on in Latin America. And how much of Mexico can you really own? And South Af Africa is a basket case. And so you have only one option. The only deep liquid emerging markets to hold a ballast exposure in, is India. 
And the best part, it's a net importer of energy and oil is down now, so it feels safe. Every emerging market manager I know, he says, and he emphasizes every single one is overweight India right now because there is nowhere else to go. There is literally, literally nowhere else for the size of emerging markets money to park. This is the main reason why the Indian markets hit a 52-week high in August, even as the US markets drop to a 52-week lows. Now, these are very specific short-term conditions of relative attractiveness that got foreigners suddenly interested in India for a period of two months. Any post-facto justification of this move with a big picture stories like India's infrastructure development, large market, China plus one, now Europe plus one, et cetera, is only a blend of patriotic and wishful thinking. The reason for India's relative attractiveness will be forgotten overnight if the global markets become even more stormy, which has started, which started happening now. As the rupee blasts to, eight, to 81 to the dollar, the Indian central bank has blown up some $90 billion in trying and failing to defend the rupee. Following an extremely hawkish stance by the US Federal Reserve last week and large hikes by global central banks all at the same time, markets have entered a new period of turmoil. India's weakness is an inherent, India is an inherently weak economy with current account and fiscal deficit and a weak rupee. The newly acquired strength is its high quality of companies and domestic institution and retail investments flowing into the market. Markets ultimately will be driven by these two factors. Decoupling has no meaning in this equation. I hope you like this video. And if you did, please do subscribe and share. Thanks for watching. Thank you.